Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort uh, with the CEO of Visible. Mig uh, Visible. I'm saying Visible. Visible. Uh, Miguel Caroga. Uh, Miguel, great to have you. Thank you, John. Looking forward to the discussion today. Well, I, I like to jump right in, and the first question I like to ask is what today's toughest problem is. For those who don't know. Um, Visible is a unit under Verizon, but this interesting model where it's, I mean, there's prepaid cellular in the wireless business, but this is all digital. So you have your whole customer experience inside an app. You pay within the app. You can pay using PayPal or Venmo. Uh, very kind of interesting uh, forward thinking. But anyway, um, during this time where we've been wrestling with so much, with the pandemic, uh, with all kinds of other issues. Starting off 2021, what's what's the biggest challenge you're facing? It's a, it's a great question, um, John. I think, you know, just like you said, we, we really are fundamentally a, a direct-to-consumer e-commerce business. And we're thinking about our mission as a way to fundamentally change the way consumers get paid for and manage their wireless service experience. Um, it's a critical category and particularly essential like a moment in time like now. And I think we perhaps never realized how important that human connection was uh, when we went through last year. And when we think about the year ahead, the path for us, um, particularly as we continue to scale and grow the business is simplicity in this category, I think is often misunderstood and perhaps not done correctly. Um, it, it's not an accident when you think about yourself as a consumer and your experience with dealing with the broader telco industry uh, from a customer experience index perspective, this category is probably the lowest of the lowest below the airline industry as well. Uh, probably the only category that performs worse is in many cases, the governmental institutions. So basically going to pay your taxes or you know, going to the DMV is the only thing that's worse than dealing with a carrier. Um, and we think there's a tremendous upside and it's such an essential service. So for us, maintain the simplicity that we started our journey on while keeping so, the agility is so important. So for you though, for you as, as a leader, as an executive, what's the hardest thing right now? Um, whether it has to do with, you know, at work dealing with, you know, executive managers, uh, employees, whether it is trying to figure out what satisfies a customer. I don't know, just, just for you, what's hard? I think keeping connected. Um, I think we've been all taught through uh, years of working in a traditional workforce environment face-to-face how do you get the emotional connection, the real understanding of what people are going through? I think that's the, been the hardest thing since 2020 and continues to be in 2021. Um, motivation uh, in, in this kind of environment is tricky, but it's not just motivation. It's also like how to keep people focused on helping each other out. Uh, our business exists is to help others. So if we're here to help each other, then sometimes we can do better. But in this kind of remote dynamic, it's challenging. Um, and it's exacerbated by like, it's not just remote work, it's remote work and remote home. And that's mm -hmm. what's I think really challenging for all of us. So what's your usual style in, in normal times when we're not on lockdown, mostly working from home, how would you be maintaining that connection? Yeah, I think um, the, the thing I think about is um, these types of businesses, technology businesses, people don't realize sometimes that the technology is actually built by people. So it's the quality of the people, the quality of the connection and the camaraderie that we have. So it's connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. If people are in remote locations, that's fine too. You do it through video, but you can also connect in person. So a combination of in-person connection, bringing people together from moments in time to focus on big opportunities. That's how, you know, for me, I stay connected with the teams. Um, it's also just a lot of one-on-ones. I mean, we're still a lean team. So being able to really connect with the entire community of the company at this stage in the growth of the business is, is really important. And it actually just makes us better every day. So I wonder about Visible, who's, who is it really for? Because, I mean, we, we've got the big kind of mainstream carriers, Verizon, of course, which owns Visible being one. And then there are these other smaller kind of prepaid players. And, you know, at times I've thought, well, this is for people who don't want the full level of the mainstream service. But then at times with the marketing, I thought these are just kind of cool services in general. And it's the, the billing is simple. Um, maybe this is for everybody. Who's it really for? I mean, I guess not if you want 5G, you're still going with Verizon right now, right? You guys are, are 4G focused. 
how do you we actually have five G as well now? Oh, you we have 5G now? Have 5G now. Okay, we do have five G as well. Yeah, I, I think the best way to think about this is when we were constructing and building the business from the ground up. We constituted like who would our target audience be? Like you're asking, and we thought ourselves of thinking who essentially are the consumers that are ultimately feel and act like digital natives. At the end of the day, people who are kind of more digitally centric is kind of the thinking. But as you know, anybody will tell you who's worked in the space for a long time. You know, that's just one construct of how people interact. The truth of it is like, I mean, I'll take my mom as an example, certainly not a digital native, but she is the heaviest texter in the family. And, you know, I had to force feed, if you will, a smartphone to her just a number, a short number of years ago. And then all of a sudden she's like adopting it. So the truth of it is, you know, technology is an enabler. Technology is an enabler to get to consumer needs. And so in many ways, while we have certainly targeted an audience that tends to skew a little bit younger, we're getting consumers from all ages and demographics because ultimately what they're looking for is simple, easy to use, a transparent experience, and something that doesn't require a spreadsheet to figure out what you're trying to do um, when you're purchasing a phone service. So I love that, but I wonder why isn't more of what Visible does just naturally integrated as a tier or type of the mainstream wireless service, like the, the ease of payment, all that stuff. I, I love that. Um, the, the simplicity in the bill, that's great. Like if it's possible to do, then why isn't it the standard? I think about it in two ways. Um, businesses like some of these larger carriers, they've been going at it for decades. They have infrastructure, they have plans, they have processes, and many of them, like any large business, is going through massive digital transformation. So there's like two paths to innovation, I think, here. One is they transform more from within, and there's another to transform adjacently. We're transforming adjacently. That's essentially what Visible is like. So, uh, you know, I think about the, the paradigm of software oftentimes is sometimes it's easier to start over from a blank sheet of paper, get the basics right, and scale from there. You know, and then there's opportunity sometimes to take something that's in motion and then transform and optimize. We're taking the you know the former approach. Let's start from a brown sheet of paper and see what we can do and how quickly we can innovate and help a consumer. Huh. Okay, so um, this is kind of that classic Skunk Works project in a way where it's like, well, what if we were to start over as Verizon um, and and do some really innovative things? Well, let's do a startup inside of our company. Yeah, that's a, probably a good way to think about it. And, you know, I would say it's neither a pure startup because clearly getting the financial backing of a, a business like Verizon, but the mechanics, the thinking, the talent, the approach, the mindset is much closer to what you see in one of the modern tech companies who are more recently entering the market. Uh, and I think there's a lot of advantages to basically thinking, how do you straddle both sides, both at scale and both an agility and nimble perspective? <clears throat> You've been in the uh, telecommunications business for a long time. So I want to get some of the lead up to that and start to talk about just how you got to the point where you're leading this company. Um, but I like to start way, way back, like at the beginning. Um, tell me about where were you born? Tell me about like your parents, your household, any siblings? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I was born here in the US. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my early formative years moving around as little time abroad, even <clears throat> my, uh, my parents actually, um, you know, I think my dad was an immigrant, he was actually from Bolivia, he was an engineer. And they met, <clears throat> excuse me, and they met in uh, California at one point in time in life. And my mom was actually, um, she's Chinese descent, but she was actually born here in the US. And she was an English teacher. And so it, in many ways, I think they uh, they formed a lot of my kind of thinking because you have like kind of the arts and the science from day one, <laughs> if right. you will. How do they meet? Uh, so they actually met uh, in the in the city in, in the in Berkeley. Actually, uh, they were basically both going to school there, uh, and so they crossed paths, and and then here we go. Uh, how long had your dad been in the area in Brooklyn in Berkeley uh, when when that connection happened? <laughs> That's a pretty insightful question. Well, the story goes that uh, his English was still in progress. So therefore, that was the insight to uh, how to, to say hello to my uh, my mom. So that's the story. So your dad must be a good looking guy, right? <laughs> well, I, I'd like to say he was both good looking and hardworking and uh, never quit. So that's kind of the mindset he brings to the table. Nice. So, but you... Uh, is the family in Berkeley for a while? Like how, where's the moving around come in? Yeah, the moving come around from my dad, his background in engineering. He was working a lot uh, in a lot of different places around the U.S. and uh, a little bit overseas for a time, especially early on when we were young. 
Uh, but eventually, you know, we settled down in Texas. Uh, that's where I spent most of my formative years. And um, I think that that experience of kind of uh, moving around a bit, even though I didn't remember it, is kind of our ethos of what we saw. And then kind of settling down in Texas is kind of where I grew up uh, for m- most of my, my childhood. Huh. What part of Texas? Uh, kind of the Dallas-Fort Worth area outside of Dallas-Fort Worth. All right. Now, and tell me, I might have missed it. You're saying we, there are siblings? Oh, yeah. Sorry. There was also a sister. You did ask that as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, older, younger? Younger. Okay. Growing up in Texas with the kind of heritage and background that you have, people are probably looking at you assuming that you're Mexican-American. I don't know. Um, and, and your background is a lot more nuanced than people probably assume. What's your sense of identity? And given that you're moving around a lot, how grounded do you feel? Yeah, you know, it's a it's an interesting experience growing up uh, in that type of environment. Um, felt very grounded. Um, I think at the same time, also searching for um, you know other people that you know felt like what I was experiencing in my own life. And truth be told, there's just not that many Bolivian Chinese running around, so you know, there's very few I've met. Uh, but that's okay. And I think that what it gave me, though, is perspective, because what I think I learned from that experience was everyone's got something to offer. And if you really pay attention, you can learn so much. And I think that's what I enjoyed about growing up where I grew up. Uh, the people I got to know, it was a great communities. And it just it was just a really great experience. What were you into as a kid? Uh, soccer and music. That was my kind of my two things. Is, is the is the soccer is that Bolivian influence there, or is it just was was soccer big in Texas at the time? No, yeah, soccer was actually pretty big in Texas. I mean, look, it's football. It's football at the time. You can love football as as well. But soccer was a growing thing in Texas at that time, also. But definitely my dad's influence. I mean, it's something we enjoyed doing and watching together. Uh, it was really a fun time. Um, and where do you go to high school? What's the the makeup of the high school like? Uh, what's your what's your focus? Is it math and science? Is it engineering? You know, it's funny. Um, I would say not so much the technical side. I mean, I was always exposed to it as a kid. Um, I remember often my dad telling me, like, when he was trying to help me with math homework, he was like, you got to get good at the math. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, in my business, if I do it wrong, the bridge falls down. And I'm like, well, that's pretty dramatic, you know. But then I wasn't just getting on that side. Like my mom, when, because she was an English teacher and, you know, word processors were just kind of coming into vogue. When she realized I could do spell check, she's like, you're absolutely not using that to write your essay. It is not going to happen because you're not going to learn how to spell. So I think for me, it was more the exposure. It was a great uh, it was a great school experience. Um, you know, my, my mom being a school teacher, of course, uh, it was it was a uh, part of that, I think. And then it just, you know, I, I think getting access to um, that particular environment, getting to do so many different things, uh, you know, particularly in the arts as well as the sciences, just gave me a broad exposure. That was exciting. But it wasn't as technical uh, for sure. <laughs> so what did you think, um, I guess, when you're going to University of Texas at Dallas, do you go in thinking, uh, I'm going to do computer science, or did you go in just not knowing? I uh, did not go in knowing. I think, I, you know, to be honest, I actually started as a chemical major, and after about one class, I decided that biochem was not something I wanted to spend the next four years thinking about and quickly exited to the next thing I knew, which is, you know, something to do with computer science. Because I had spent time doing things in computers since a very young age. My dad had exposed me to that, but it was never like the thing. And so I think that was something that, uh, <laughs> I guess, in, in, in hindsight, that was a fortuitous opportunity to shift to things. Um, and that's kind of how I shifted into the computer science world. What what were you, were you thinking computer science would turn into at the time? Um, you know, back then, uh, you know, we were in college at right around the same time, yeah. um, the web browser just became a thing in 1994 when we were freshmen. Like Windows 3.1 right. was the hot new technology and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> you know, c- computer science was not quite as mainstream and and the path to riches. Yeah, I um, I honestly I don't think had context for what technology could offer. It was just more I think an interest. Um, and it was kind of a pastime, I think, like anything else. And, um, and I still remember that dial-up tone like it was yesterday. We were trying to do schoolwork back then. And even like, I mean, it's not that long ago, right? But um, yeah, I, I don't think I had perspective. Uh, you know, the exposure there was different. Um, it was more learning the basics around certain things. Um, I think as I got an early exposure 
because I was actually interning while I was still going to school and working part time. That's where I started to see the value of what technology could potentially offer and where technology was not the end game. It was it was like, you know, enabler towards making things happen. Interning where? Uh, I was actually interning at a couple different telco companies at the time. Uh, and one of the original uh, kind of predecessors of Verizon, you know, before it became a, a conglomerate between Bell Atlantic and GT. Um, why telco? Uh, well, so the Dallas Fort Worth area was a huge telco market at the time. I mean, like literally you could like stumble outside of the streets of uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area and just like anywhere you turn, you're walking into a telco because it was like the mecca of telco at the time and uh, continues to be strong in that space. But I think that's one of the reasons that it was an opportunity there. Uh, I got an internship or two at a couple of jobs and I was like, wow, this is fun. I could earn a little bit of money. I uh, continue to pursue some other things on the side as well. Mm. Um, as you're going through college, having experience, getting older, how does that affect your view of your cultural identity and um, how that plays into both your social interactions and what you want to do in life? Yeah, it's 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 an interesting question. I think like everyone, you experience these new moments when you're like, I think I know myself, and then you go to like college, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't know myself, and I'm exposed to all these new things and new people and new ideas. Uh, it was enriching. It was it was also challenging because you're like, wait, is what I thought was true about who I where I came from, what I'm doing, and what do I want to do? And I think that existential question for me was always like, what do I actually want to do? Uh, even going through college, I was like, yeah, the computer science thing is interesting, but it's it's a gig. I didn't really understand what it could accomplish. I had other interests and I wasn't really clear, you know, to be honest, that when I was during the time in college. How, how much did your kind of family of origin influence your mindset? Because I talked to a lot of CEOs, talked to a lot of founders who um, either immigrated themselves or their parents did. And there's this sort of achievement oriented next generation is going to get the advantages that i didn't have mindset that's driving them where there's you know so expectations um riding on what they do did you did you feel that or was it a little bit looser in your ability to sort of take space and find yourself so i think um the way i was raised my parents always encouraged me to explore everything and then and expose myself to everything. But I think the mindset of never quit was certainly instilled through kind of that uh, dynamic of being, you know, first generation in the US or immigrating to the US. It certainly had a huge influence. Uh, the grit, the resilience, uh, the never quit mindset, I think was pretty strong throughout uh, growing up. I remember many moments where talking to my parents, particularly my dad, he would be like, well, just kind of figure it out. Like, it, there's just like not an option. It's like, you know, going backwards is not a possibility. It has been a huge influence on my life for sure. Uh, and even in moments where there was a lot, a lot of clarity, um, you know, because so often ambiguity is the reality of, of life. I think it's really helped me shape the way I think and the way I approach problem solving. So talk to me about music um, <laughs> and playing instrument. Where does that come in? So I guess maybe because my mom was always a fan of music. Uh, so she wasn't a musician herself. She always wanted me to get encouraged me. So I was taking piano lessons from a very early age. I also played drums and um, I loved it. I mean, there's something about music. It was always filled in the house and it's just, uh, it's like the, 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 the common message and the common kind of connector for a lot of things and a lot of cultures. Probably would say it's my first passion. It's a bit of the universal language. And um, I did that for a long time. Um, eventually getting to the point where I was doing my own production work, or creative work, and uh, it was a pretty fun experience. Um, it was a hobby, you know, so <laughs> everything from doing music to like, you know, DJing proms and stuff like that, that's always fun. But, you know, eventually getting a chance to actually do stuff like pressing vinyl, which was an experience of itself. So while you were talking about like in, you know, the the era of like the dot com boom, I was worrying about pressing vinyl, which probably was not the best opportune time to be thinking about pressing vinyl at the time. But it was a fun experience. It taught me a lot, it taught me a whole lot, actually. It's, it's a pretty cool time, though. I'm thinking, like, piano is one thing, but if you're playing drums, then people are asking you to play in bands, right? Yeah, I did play in a band for a brief time. I was, what uh, kind of band? What kind of band? It was, it, was a, it was a, a straight-up punk band. Uh, it was fun. It was right in that alternative 90s frame. Uh, just a short stint. 
for just a summer, but it was a, one of the better, uh, more fun experiences in my life for sure. Summer of 90 what? Gosh, I don't even know now. Let's see. I'm not sure. It was like late 90s now. <laughs> Must have been uh, 97, something like that. That's right around the time. I mean, you know, I had my guitar. I was in Myrtle Beach, you know, <laughs> uh, doing my thing there too. And, uh, you know, I had a band, a cover band in Lexington, Kentucky mm. called Face the Dog. <laughs> right around 99. So um, what what are you picking up um, being influenced by playing in front of people, at least even for this short stint of time, being the drummer in a band? Well, the drummer in a band was one thing. I think definitely just the the collaboration aspect. I mean, I think you're connecting. I mean, I think sometimes people don't realize music is, you know, there's certainly the, the genius aspect of the people who are truly in that category. But it's, it's about camaraderie and it's about that process. I think for me, as I, because, you know, the, the drumming was one part, but I put a lot more attention around the production side of it and uh, creating music, particularly electronic music that, you know, kind of lean to both the technology, the creative, but the procedural side, and then also listening to your audience. Like that is a big thing I learned because at the end of the day, a performance is about someone else. It's not about you. And I think in that context, particularly for the type of work I was trying to do, it was like, how do I connect to people in a different way? How do I use this art form to like kind of, find more interesting things to say and talk about. Maybe some of the some of the stuff you were doing as well. Well, what, what were you trying to do? Because, you know, a, a lot of times I was just trying to get a date. You know, <laughs> I, I got an acoustic guitar. I mean, in the, it wasn't it wasn't that complicated. Just trying to jam out with friends. What what's what's your vision here? At that time, my vision was just like, hey, I have something to say. I want to put it on on some sort of release or something. And can I put it out into the world and just see what happens? and just hear it you know hear it out there and um that process of kind of like putting product out even though i didn't know what that's what it was taught me a whole lot about how to think about releasing and getting it wrong and sometimes getting it right so i think that that was the objective was just to get the some ideas out there and just share it with people tell me about getting it wrong and getting it right how did that play out <laughs> well i mean this is getting super technical in the weeds but if you're taking a, a piece of vinyl and you could do what's called a dub plate and you can actually take the dub plate and essentially, which is just like a, a test copy of a piece of record, that dub plate has too much bass. It's too heavy on the bass. You put that thing on a record turntable, it flips. And basically the record's unplayable. So you can imagine handing a, a record, which you spent a lot of money on because it's a one-off to a DJ. And then the thing just goes, and it's just like the entire uh, room of many hundred or a thousand people stop and then it's very challenging. So there's moments about getting like it wrong and that's both technical and right in your face of like, hey, that didn't work the way it was supposed to. And did your band break up or did something else happen? Sounds like a <laughs> short period of time. No, it was, it was something uh, that I chose that it was like a hobby, but I realized it wasn't really gonna be for me for the long term. And you know, some of the people I worked with continued in the industry and continue to do their own thing. Uh, but it just became a passion that helped influence kind of the next stage of things I was doing around more the engineering side of things and other things around the business world. What is music to you now? Is it something that you go back to to reflect? Is it, I mean, for me, it always was. I mean, in, in, in just about trying to pick up girls. Um, <laughs> for, for, for me, it, it was about songwriting. It was about this kind of alchemy where you could take something like pain and turn it into something good, turn it into something beautiful um, that other people could experience, could appreciate. And so through like alienating times, difficult experiences, feeling isolated at times, you know, in, in college, I, I was in rural Indiana, oftentimes doing internships in places like, you know, Lexington, Kentucky, or, you know, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, you know, it's, it's something that sustained me. What is it for you? I think uh, you said you said it very well. That I think it's a it's a bit of a a moment of solace. You can create, you know, this moment between something you've created, the words, the the emotions, and turning it into a, a kind of a reflection. I think in many ways it was um, a way to kind of get the, the the feelings out and into putting it and immortalizing it, and then also just packaging up and moving on somewhat. Um, for now, I think for me it's it's a bit of the language. Um, I think it's. Uh, inspiring. Um, I think it's kind of the essence. I mean, it's something that literally is the universal language. Uh, you look at any culture, there's so many similarities between different types of music. And I think it's always been something that I feel is a way to connect with others and a way to kind 
kind of inspire myself uh, in a moment of both of solace or a moment of, hey, when I get fired up to do something. <laughs> so are you passing that along to anybody? Well, definitely. Um, certainly my little one. She's far too little to actually know, but she certainly thinks she's uh, – Anytime I get anywhere near that something looks remotely like a speaker, she's demanding to hear a little bit of music. So we'll see what happens. It's a long way to go. Love that. Yeah, I've, I've got uh, two boys, and both of them are playing piano right now, and I try to keep that going. Um, now, I, I like to ask about an experience that I call Death Valley, lowest point. Um, has there been a time in your life or career where you thought, what you were going through was so difficult, so jarring, that it yanked the rug out from under you. You thought maybe this entire plan that I've had, this direction that I've been taking is wrong um, or, or has to be rethought. Has, has anything like that happened to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think about an early moment in my career where um, you know, up until then, things have been smooth, continual growth, continual opportunities to really make things happen. This is... Uh, something that you know, I realized. So I was working on essentially a new concept, you know, not too indifferent than what I've been doing today at Visible, but a much smaller scale. And that concept was something I'd sold, something I'd gotten people behind. And eventually then it turned into one of the worst experiences because I was basically then asked to completely shut down something that was my vision and a concept that I believed in, not just me, but a lot of people. So while it was in the context of a larger kind of uh, business, it, it felt not unlike like losing your primary investor crew all at one time in like a 24 hour window and letting everyone have to walk out the door. Um, it was pretty uh, groundbreaking and kind of broke me open a bit um, because I realized I was like, what could I have done differently to not achieve this outcome when I still believe in the spirit of what I was trying to do? It taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how to, uh, the principles of just alignment and connection and making sure there's continuity. And also taught me that sometimes you just can't control the outcome and you just gotta pick up and keep going. And then make sure that the lessons you you learn from that prior experience you can forward apply. Uh, but it took a while. It took a while to really kind of rethink that and understand what really happened. So was this a pressing the vinyl wrong situation? Or no, this was a business was this situation. Business? This was no, a business but, situation. Yeah. But what, what, <laughs> what, what, did did you were you were you and the team building it wrong, or was it just either the wrong time or the powers that be made the wrong call? It was uh, the wrong time perhaps a little bit too early on the innovation curve, a little bit too aggressive. I think that also the priorities of what really mattered, this just basically just fell below the line of what was the most important thing for that window of time. And uh, those two things combined uh, for any sort of major investment can unfortunately be a, a very problematic situation if you wanna keep that investment going. Well, it sounds like you've got it at arm's length now, but at the time, did it feel personal? Did it feel like Absolutely. it reflected on either your ability, your potential? Tell me how you work through that. Yeah, I think um, anyone who's invested in something, if they don't see it personally, I think, you know, it's doing yourself with the service a bit. Sometimes that self-reflection was like, yeah, it feels personal. Um, yeah, with distance, you can say like, well, it probably wasn't really personal. It was circumstantial. There's always some aspect though of like, you have to take ownership. And I think at the end of the day, I. I still look back at that moment and say, yeah, there was probably a couple of things. Would it have flipped the script? Maybe, maybe not. But I'll know that next time I could try a couple more things because, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of my mindset of how I grew up, but I'm like, there's always another way. And so <laughs> I'm kind of like, yeah, that didn't work out, but I'm sure I probably could have fixed it if I tried something else. And so like that learning process, you know, you just um, perhaps getting the right kind of alignment, if you will, or the right focus, or perhaps finding the one thing that's something, you know, you realize that the consumer actually needs that is just too compelling to say no to. And I think that last insight is kind of the most important thing is to say, look, at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to have something happen. As long as that's part of your pipeline, your roadmap, oftentimes it's the most important thing and it gets done. We're kind of abstract now. How much can you tell me about what this was? Because now I got all kinds of questions like, <laughs> do we see it reflected in any uh, services or, or customer demand now? Um, let's see here. Probably not. It was probably one of these more kind of uh, transformative moments from behind the scenes. Um, needless to say, I think some of the ideas stayed true, which I was pleased to see. Like it didn't completely die in the vine, but it was more about the approach and the execution, the timing. So um, it's good to see that some of it still survived. So how do you now go about testing for looking for that customer alignment that maybe wasn't a fit on that project? 
but that you know if you had it to do over again you think that's one of the things you might think back for yeah i think um these uh products in the technology industry so often are perceived as just like there's this thing and you use it but the reality is you have to like know that there's humans on either end there's the humans that are building it and there's the humans that are using it and i think so often we lose the emotion in it and so often lose the point of why we're doing it in the first place and so i think that alignment aspect of like really get that feedback loop tight every component of our business you know whether it's the work we're doing at visible or prior generations of things i've done is how close can you get to your customer and also how close can you get to the people that really matter you know if, if i think about you know in a corporate environment oftentimes the people who are part of the corporate uh, hierarchy they're essentially your investors they're the people that essentially are driving and putting the investment behind the work we do uh, and any sort of these dynamics, you know, visible is just one example of that. So I think in many ways, that's how I think about it is making sure you're staying close to the consumer, close to your stakeholders about what, you know, what the vision and the goals are and constantly optimizing. There's really just no way out. It's just rigor and operational discipline. So process wise, um, at visible, your app is particularly important. You, you have your end users spending a lot of time there doing payments there, et cetera. How is that idea reflected in how you maybe develop, test that environment? Because if you're going to have the right alignment, it's got to be there. How did you do that differently? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I think I think about it like this way is um, an environment and not too dissimilar to e-commerce businesses where there are no stores, but in a category where, I mean, think about the average consumer in the U.S. If you think the word like, you know, phone service, the first thing that pops in your head is retail store. Like it's just like what the industry is trained and educated the consumer to think. We're trying to re-educate the consumer and say there's another way and perhaps a smoother way to do things in a different way. And this is what we essentially did is when we structured the team, the way we thought about uh, the customer centric approach to building, we thought about how we developed the right type of resources and talent. Because remember, we're going this from scratch of product design and engineering, that ecosystem, but also for a business like us in a crowded marketplace, how powerful the brand can be to really kind of um, authenticate and kind of accelerate people's understanding of what the value proposition we're providing. So it's the mix of the technology components with the creative that I think really make things compelling for us in the visible context. I want to go back um, when we were talking about that uh, Death Valley experience. And we talked about some of the things that you got out of it, but I want to zero back in and try to get the most important thing. Like when you really look back on that, is there one particular thing besides the uh, the customer alignment piece that sticks out that you've continued to carry with you, maybe having your toolbox as a, as a manager and a CEO now? So I think it's um, that effort was to me, it felt very much of a kind of a, an aspect of how do you transform things. And I think that was something on the experience I had at Fios and even the experience at Visible where you're trying to transform an industry. And Fios, it was more about, you know, digital transformation from within. Um, the essence of each of those moments, including that Death Valley moment was, okay, so there's the customer centricity. You got to understand the customer problem really clearly and focus on that. But it's also the quality of the talent. And I know that different moments in this time and during that Death Valley moment, we had a great team in place. And so there was an example where like, do you actually, um, did we craft the right team? The answer was yes, but it wasn't just pointed at the right problem. So that aspect of like, don't lose sight of just because one thing doesn't work. Don't assume that the other things that got you there are equally important. Talent is a crucial part of that. And the other thing I'd share is that that dynamic that I learned in that experience was um, resources that come from inside the company and resources that come from with outside a company that, me that meshing of great ideas is actually how you get awesome things to happen, particularly in more established industries, because you know you, you can reinvent certain things, but sometimes you're reinventing the wrong thing and you're wasting time. Um, so I think there's there's this kind of perfect balance of you know, outside in thinking and inside out thinking that really gets the most compelling outcomes. Hmm. Um, tell me what's your best failure? The, the thing that didn't work out you know, besides this thing that didn't work out, but the thing that didn't work out that you learned the most from. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think this is one of the best examples. Uh, I mean, I think there's a multiple versions of, of picking resources and people to come and join uh, a business uh, opportunity. Um, early on, I remember picking a candidate in one of my first kind of pretty big hires and it didn't quite work out. Uh, and I realized two things. Number one, um, 
there was nothing wrong with the decision to pick the person. It just sometimes doesn't work. And, you know, there was things I could have picked up on, but how fast can you act to resolve it? Because it's never good for the candidates or, or for the resource here. And I think that's such an important thing is that teams evolve, businesses evolve. It's not just about the people, but it's about the combination of the team and it has to work together. I talked to uh, another CEO in recent months and I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was the best failure answer or what, but he, he said something I thought was interesting about hiring. He said, uh, the most important thing is the references, not the resume. And he thinks that he could almost hire someone without ever meeting them just by interviewing the people who they've worked with before. And not, not references, not the people who they give so much as the people that they've worked with closely before. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about that concept, that idea? So you do get a lot from those connections because you know it's the outside in thinking, um, but there's also no substitute from actually connecting with somebody who you actually need to collaborate with. Um, I think the, that, that component of it is super important, but I, I do think there's real value to that. Now, you know, there's, there's always kind of bias issue of like, just by, cause you meet someone means you have no idea if they're going to work out for you. So I think there's that component, but, um, I don't know what you would like, I think, you know, sitting down with someone, even if it is virtually like this in this environment, it's so powerful to just see, understand is there a real connection? Cause I think at the end of the day, we're spending more of our time in a work environment than we are with their family. So you want to make sure that there's real connection and real affinity to try to get things done together. So what do you think is going to happen um, when when things open back up, Lord willing, later this year, if we figure out these uh, vaccine distribution logistics and can uh, work through the population, what happens to work, work from home, travel? Yeah, uh, you know, for 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 the work from home, I think, you know, it's interesting for, for Visible because we were already pretty young and early in our business, we basically made a choice to become much more of a, a focused remote work environment. You know, we actually shut down our offices during the COVID window and um, it's working for us, you know, um, and I think it's something we're going to continue. But I think the reality is connecting live um, is something that's important. You just can't uh, afford not to do that, but it's how you do it. It's it, or do you have to be in the office every single day facing each other? No. Uh, but you might want to be in a situation where particularly on certain opportunities or unique builds or uh, certain efforts, you want to be connected. And so I think there's an opportunity to do a little of both. I think back to your travel question, John, um, that remains to be seen. I mean, I think there's a spectrum of all the different variations. But, um, you know, I, I would suggest that uh, in many ways, this kind of experience of being remote has kind of leveled the playing field a bit. Uh, so often I could be imagined, you know, where. If I was managing a team and there are multiple locations, then no one has direct access to me as the leader. Uh, that could be both good and bad. But then you also want to make sure you don't disenfranchise people who are have a little bit closer geographic connection. So I think travel all of a sudden becomes like, it's particularly in the work context, yeah, it's super important. We want to get face to face, but it's not the only thing that will uh, enable things to make progress. There's other ways to go forward, uh, making remote work successful. Tell me more about how you think this experience is going to change the way you manage. I mean, when we have the option to see people in person, you know, in some cases we're going to pick it. Um, but I guess to com connect with people remotely, um, I, I don't know. What, what do you think is going to change about the way you do what you do? Um, I think for me, and I, and me, I was fortunate enough too to have a, an experience where I was managing a pretty large team globally in over 10 or 15 different sites, um, you know, both here in the US and overseas. And um, I found that what's important is actually the point you just said, which is connection. You actually need to spend the time to get one-on-one -on -one quality time to get to connect to the people that actually matter in your business. And those are your employees. Um, so I think for me, what's changing is to ensure that not only am I doing it, but my team is doing it. Um, you know, I, I've seen this happen in so many different environments where like two people are arguing each other over email and you look over and you're like, they literally sit next to each other <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? And it's, it's, it has nothing to do with, you know, how close you are. It's everything to do with, do we have the kind of common understanding, kind of the social contract and how to do business? And I think that's what I really think we have to emphasize in, in this kind of remote environment. My style, I think what I, I do realize is we have to connect at a much more personal level, even than you used to before. Like the hallway conversation, you have to be almost like formalize the informal, which is kind of weird, but it, it actually helps me think about how to ensure that uh, people don't get left behind, you know, because it's the people who often 
are not as comfortable talking up, you want to make sure that you're hearing from them as well. Tell me about the past year and your growth rates. What have you seen? Uh, how is Visible positioned um, for the rest of 2021? Yeah. So it's interesting. This, you know, the category of you know telcos obviously is, it's an essential service. So it's it's pretty obvious that that's important, and we happen to be kind of future proof in that. I mean, I kind of think about it in some kind of way. It's like we always kind of imagined our kind of north stars, like, hey, we're the future of what wireless service should be, and all of a sudden, like, the future fast forwarded, and like it's really right now. Touch experience is really important, um, and so I think in many ways we were pretty happy with how we were able to kind of navigate the last year. The growth rates were very strong, very healthy. Um, we were continuing to connect and help people in need because ultimately that's what we think our service is about is like, you know, creating that type of human connection in a very seamless way. Uh, it poises us, you know, for the year ahead. Uh, we think, you know, look, like you said, like, it's not like the pandemic is over, right? It's still in progress and we still think we're here to help and continue to grow um, as, you know, we continue to connect with our consumers and members. They, they can clearly see the value we're offering and and they really value the experience we provide. So we're really excited and really bullish about the year ahead. Well, I think that's uh, a great note uh, where we can uh, wrap things up. Miguel, it's been uh, great hearing about what you're working on at Visible and, um, you know, how you got to this point after uh, so many kind of rich and varied experiences in the telecom industry. Thanks, John. Really appreciate the time.